of Self Wealth Live. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, this is the second instalment where we've pre-recorded uh, a show and I'm joined by Drew Meredith from Water Partners. How are you going, mate? Pretty good. Good to be back. In the first session, we talked about uh, what is passive income, how to how you think about building a portfolio, generally speaking, what you can expect from different parts of a portfolio. In, t- in tonight's session, we're going to be sharing, we're going to be going through 10 different stocks or ETFs or funds, and we're going to be talking about where they might sit, how you can think about them. And for the most part, if you are tuning in for the first time, you can go into your self-wealth account and you can invest in a lot of these things straight in your account. For the first time in a very long time, when it comes to passive income, you're able to build a fully diversified portfolio through a listed, what we call like ASX listed, like through your brokerage account, um, all of these different components. Whereas if you go back five, maybe, maybe, maybe five years ago, maybe 10 years ago, that was very, very difficult unless you were seeing a financial advisor like Drew. Uh, Drew, but for folks that are just tuning in, um, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, we talked about this in the first episode, but yeah. um, like, what do you do for a day job? Day job, financial advisor. Financial uh, advisor. Run a group called Waddle Partners with my business partner, Jamie Nemsis. Uh, essentially, we uh, over 17 years of experience as a yeah. financial advisor. We worked out where we could add the most value to, to a, a group of clients, and that's in helping them build passive retirement income. Yeah. Uh, and we found that it requires a completely different approach and it, it requires a focus on dealing with the emotional part of retirement as well as the income and investing part. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you're based here in Melbourne, but uh, you have clients all around Australia, right? Yeah, travel just about uh, monthly or every six six weeks or so to every major capital city. Yep. Not Quite regional. A, yeah, racking up those uh, Virgin Velocity points or Definitely Qantas frequent flight many. points. Yeah, for sure. Someone asked me when I watched Top Gun and I can't remember which flight that was on. <laughs> so, um, so, we're going to be talking about 10 different stocks or ETFs, as I said. Uh, but in the first session, if this is your first time tuning into Self Wealth Life, welcome to the show. Don't forget to hit subscribe on YouTube because we go live every week. Uh, but on the 25th of this month, Drew and I will be going live talking directly to you and answering questions. We're going to answer a few of those questions throughout this series, probably before we get there, but I highly encourage you to ask your questions and bank them up on that night. This is the second session. In the next session, which will fi- which will be released next week, we are talking about how to build a portfolio that is able to achieve $80,000 a year in passive income. If you didn't see the first uh, installment, Passive income is income that you don't have to work for. Active income would be that stuff. That's the stuff where you go to your nine to five or you have your job and you uh, earn that income through your labor or through your time uh, or your intellectual property, of course. When we talk about passive income, we're talking about a portfolio, whether that's a collection of shares, businesses, property, anything that can give you money, whether you're sleeping, whether you're jogging, whether you're walking, whether you're sitting down, whether you're at work or not. So, that's what this series is all about. Now, Drew, I guess the first thing is like we're going to talk about stocks. We're going to talk about ETFs. We're going to talk about funds. Multiple asset classes. Yeah. Multiple asset classes. So, not just shares. We're going to talk about everything. Um, can you? Can we just start off with just something really high level? Um, when you build portfolios, do you use things like ETFs? Do you use more managed funds. How do you think about like what actually is used to get exposure? In a complicated way, we'd say we're product agnostic. So, what does that mean? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Staying away from religion, it just means that we don't care what the product is. Yep. We, we, so, you don't care if it's an ETF or a managed fund or a listed investment company. You don't really care. Exactly. Yeah. So, we work with uh, Atchison Consultants um, who help build, help build and provide governance around asset allocation and portfolio construction. Yep. And the concept there is find, determine what exposure you want, then determine the best way to do it. Usually, you'd start with the lowest cost and whether that gives you the, the most appropriate exposure to, say, the ASX or government bonds. And then if not, then you start going down the spectrum. So, if it's not a low-cost ETF, then you start to think about can ETFs uh, or can active management add value in that particular sector? Okay. So, this is something that I've been talking about uh, through the RAS community for quite a few years now is like the best expression. 
And a lot of people don't think about this uh, as, as this way, but I, I learned this many years ago, probably about five to 10 years ago now from a guy named Rodney, who's a very experienced investment consultant. He said, at any one time, you need to identify what you want yep. and then you're trying to find how is that expressed? And as you said, that could be, I'm looking for Australian shares and I want it to be lowest cost because that seems reasonable. Yep. But people should also be mindful, as we talked about in the first uh, installment, is that it's not all about cost. We, we constantly, as an industry and people observing the industry, say low cost, low cost, low cost. But it's not all about low cost, right? Well, beta is free. So, the market return is free is, is one of our kind of core Because tenants. the ETFs are so cheap. Exactly. Yeah. But the beta and the market return is the average. Yep. So, you're getting the average. If the average is minus 40, you're getting minus 40. If it's up eight, you're getting eight. Yeah. There's, there's no- there's no uh, diversification. You're just getting what it is. Yeah. It's it's when you want to look beyond that, or when you're for us, you know, investing for decumulation. Yep. We don't think it's appropriate to be a hundred percent in the average and just accept what the market brings. Yep. We want to be able to protect. Our focus is always on kind of protecting the downside to a to a level, uh, and to do that, you need to think about alternatives, whether that's in active management or in different asset classes, yep. compared to traditional bonds and equities. Yeah, and even here in Australia, in the Australian market, it could be direct stocks. Um, it could be really anything. Like, how do you get exposure uh, through self wealth? Obviously, it's nine dollars nine dollars fifty to place a trade. Um, whether you're buying ETFs or whether you're buying shares or whatever, um, which is fantastic because you know the cost involved to get in and out, which is super cheap. Uh, it's super transparent. So uh, it's a great way to build a portfolio because you know what you're going to be on the hook for. So. <clears throat> Let's dive into these without further ado, mate. Um, I'm going to reference some screen sharing as we go <coughs> through this. Uh, and for those of you watching the video, you'll be able to see my screen inside Self Wealth when we go through this. Um, but we've got these 10 different ideas that we're bringing to the table. And we don't want to say that these are a recommendation. We just want to highlight them as things that you can use to construct a portfolio. Yep. And we're not making any type of forecast of what's going to happen in 2023, 2024. That's not, as if you've watched episode one, it's not what we're here to do. We're here to tell you how to build a portfolio that is resilient over the ultra long term. So, with that said, Drew, I might actually, I know the 10 things because we were talking about them before we started recording, but can we just start with something, with the, the most basic thing on this list? Can we start with the Vanguard VAS ETF, the Australian Shares Index ETF? Because I feel like that's an easier place to start for a lot of viewers who are regular viewers of Self Wealth Live, uh, they will know what this is. Of course. And that's, is it the single biggest yes. ETF? It is? Yeah. So, I'm just I showing it on my screen guess. here. I'm pretty sure it is. It's, I did the numbers, the most recent numbers that I did showed that it's 55% bigger than the next closest ETF. <laughs> Which is probably also Vanguard. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, it, I can't remember, I, I don't think, it, I think VGS, mm. yeah. Vanguard uh, Global Shares ETF is I think fourth or fifth. Yep. I think it might even be the STW ETF, the yep. ASX oh, 200, probably, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's used yeah, very broadly. Yep. So, tell us about the VAS ETF. What does it actually do? How would you use it? So, it's a traditional index fund. Yep. Tracks the performance of the S&P ASX 300. Yep. Uh, weighted according to market cap or the size. So, the larger the company, the larger the weight within the ETF. Yep. And essentially, when you watch the news every night, Will the mar- when they say the market went went up one percent, VAS is tracking what the market's doing. Hmm. Uh, broadly, it's you know this is one of the unique things. It says it tracks the three hundred, but it actually holds three hundred and five companies. Yeah, so, so people <laughs> often get thrown off by that. What well, do you say? It's three hundred, but there's three hundred and five in here. Yeah, <laughs> I mean part of that I think is rebalancing. Like yeah. if there's quarterly rebalancing, um, as most fund managers they don't necessarily want to sell immediately yep. because there, there's a thing called index arbitrage but we don't need to go that that's probably yep. another session yep uh and the index itself only has 299 holdings so there's a whole difference of six but the return is almost identical yep. uh after the only difference would be the fees so i think this one costs 10 basis points so the 0. return one yep. percent yeah so the return will be 0.1 percent lower then the benchmark is what you'd expect from this. So, this is the thing. Um, that's what you'd expect and that's what we're trying to think. Like, if it just follows the market and it only costs me 0.1% per year, which is taken out automatically, by the way, you don't pay that as a f- fee. Yeah. Um, the thing is, they 
I don't want to complicate it too much, but they also do a bit of short shorting. Oh, so you outperform. So you can yeah. actually outperform the index yeah. as well. And that's how they can get it so close. We call this tracking error, by the way, which is the difference between the index that they're trying to track and the fund's performance. They try to get exactly even. So the tracking Zero. error is like nothing. Yeah. Um, and that's how they can do it. And a lot of people don't think about that. Um, but I just got on the screen here in front of us, Drew. You can't see this because it's on my screen. <laughs> Apologies about that. Um, <clears throat> Inside the self-wealth community, the VAS ETF is the number one ETF by weight. Yep. And that is completely not surprising because it is so much bigger than everything else. It's just a pure core. Yeah. Yep. It's that right in the middle of the core portfolio that you're building. But it is also the number one um, almost each and every week when we do self-wealth live and we go through the top five most bought lists. This is almost number one each and every week. <laughs> like, there's no question. It's people just dollar cost averaging, buying regularly. And we can see that here. 63% of people who buy this. So, it is a, <clears throat> the reason that they're buying is to align with the target portfolio. Interestingly, it's only this, it's the seventh highest by rank of ownership. And what I mean by that is you'd probably have Commonwealth Bank in more portfolios. You'd probably have a CSL. bunch of different ETFs yeah. in more portfolios. But by the weighting in portfolios, this is number one. Yep. Question for you, given this is a, um, you know about passive income, um, and the yield on this thing is just basically reflects what the ASX is. Sometimes it's, you know, three, four, five percent. Where does this sit in your four buckets? So you've got the growth bucket. For those of you that didn't see number one, you've got the growth alternatives, you've got defensive alternatives, and you've got defensive. Where does this sit? Directly in growth. So Directly in growth. Yeah. Okay. Growth is where your traditional equity is going to be, whether it's domestic or global. Yep. Uh, and that's just because it's going to, it's average, as we said, it moves like the market. So it's not, it is fully correlated with the market. Yep. So it is, it is the market, basically. Yep. Yeah. So the, the, another thing that you might see inside your self wealth account here uh, on, your, on the screen in front of me, you can see that it says yield 7.2%. I want to make something very clear, which we touched on a little bit in the first one, which is that. Do not be fooled by this because what happens is you are getting, as we talked about in the first installment of this passive income series, you're getting the capital return to you. Yep. So that's not that yield could be that it's what we call a distribution, the distribution of capital as well as income. So there could be, if it's, if we assume that the, the entire market pays 4%, there could be 3% of capital gains being paid back to you. Yep. And that's not what we're talking about when we talk about passive income. So you would probably choose to reinvest that back in if you wanted to. Um, so this is right in the core, Drew. Um, ASX 300 is a little bit unique. We've talked about this before. About 31% mid to small caps yeah. within there. So it's a bit more diversified than this in, say, the ASX 200. Yeah. Uh, more Slightly more sectors, 28% in banks, naturally, 24% yep. in materials, and then 10 in health and six in retailers. Yep. So, slightly more diversified than the 200 is why we've t tended to prefer the 300 as the core, yep. given that a little bit of additional diversification. Okay. So, that's great. So, this is right in the core of a portfolio. I, I, personally, I would be happy to have this in my portfolio. In fact, I think I do have it in my portfolio, full disclosure. <laughs> so, um, not that we're moving the market or anything like that here on uh, Self-Worth Live, but- um, yeah, it's a very well-trodden ETF. People have used it for a long, long time because it has been used even before it was an ETF. It was an index fund that you just go to the Vanguard website and you'd apply to invest in directly. Yep. So, this has been going for a very, very long time. And 1997 maybe. Yeah. So, even though the ETF is newer than that, it's it's been around for a very long time. Maybe now we can transition to another one, which is one run by Vanguard. Another yes. super popular one that we've spoken about before, but also on Self Wealth Live, Drew, we've spoken about this quite a bit, which is the VHY ETF. Yes. So, just to fill people in, the VHY ETF, it's a very similar ticker symbol. I'll get it up on the screen in front of me here. VHY, it's the name says Vanguard Australian shares. So, it sounds like the first one that we just talked about but it's got high yield ETF. Yeah. So, it's different. There's something different about it. Can you c explain what that means? So, it's still an index fund. So, everything Vanguard does tracks an index. The yep. difference of this one is it tracks the FTSE Australian high yield index, which essentially tries to invest into 70 of the ASX companies expected to pay the best dividends yep. over the next 12 months. Yep. Best and sustainable dividends, I think, Yep. based on broker forecasts. So, we can see in the self-wealth community here in front of me that it there's seventy nine percent of people have been buying in the last little while, but um, of those <clears> that buy, forty four percent say it's a good paying stock or ETF. Yep. Um, good dividend paying stock or ETF, and it's aligning with a target portfolio. So, 
We often get the question, Drew, and I imagine you do too, that could you use this in your core portfolio? Is yes. it? Could you use that in there? I think so. Well, if you look at the diverse, you, as a low cost core, it's still reasonably low cost. Yep. Uh, and the, the, the nature of the ASX is that it's not particularly diversified anyway. Yeah. So even this one has 40% in financials, the uh, 300 had 38% yep. uh, and the and 20% in materials. So you're getting a very similar exposure to two sectors. So uh, for income focused investors, it could also play a role as the core, I think, yep. um, and remaining pretty low cost. In It's interesting. So one of the things that we look at when we look at dividend ETFs, and we've covered a full session on this on Self Worth Live, one of the things to be mindful of is a lot of the dividend ETFs, they're not always being what I'd call intelligent. They might just scrape and look at like what was the biggest dividend yield last year or last six months, yeah. which is not very intelligent. So to overcome that hurdle, what Vanguard did was it put in place this idea that it could pull a database of analyst forecasts that suggest what is coming up. So yeah. not looking backwards, looking forward to say what's coming up to make it a bit more intelligent. And analysts tend to be quite good at 12 month forecasts, but not beyond it. Yeah. You know, six to 12 months. So actually predicting the next year's dividends are usually quite good at. And they're pretty good. I would say most analysts are pretty good at dividend forecasts in particular. Yeah. I think that the profit forecasts are almost always wrong. Yeah. And price targets. Yeah. And all that. Like the valuations are almost always wrong. But the actual dividend targets are really interesting. Yeah. Um, and with we, we'll get into this when we talk about individual stocks, but um, and I'll show you that when some stocks come up in a little bit. But you can see them inside the self wealth platform. You can see the analyst forecast for dividends, uh, which is super neat. So, um, so the yield difference is yeah, this is what, four point three on the three hundred yep. versus five point five on VHY. So you're getting an extra just on top of my head one point two one point two percent a twenty five percent higher dividend plus franking on top of that. So that takes you I think it'd be over eight percent including franking. Yep. For this one. And this is really important to understand is I was initially very hesitant towards this ETF, this dividend ETF, because yep. I was like, to be honest, why wouldn't I just invest in the growth version, you know, and just take, if I wanted to, I can just take some off the table. Yep. But what I realized, and I think you might have told me this, um, is that if you're harvesting franking credits, you want to get dividend income. Yeah, because it's more tax effective, particularly if you're building a retirement style portfolio, and if you're holding it through superannuation, yeah, specifically, yep. yeah, it's it's a free kick for retirees at the moment, and that's why the government constantly talks about banning <laughs> franking of- credits, <laughs> yeah, which will never happen. I mean, worst case, you'll end up having a cap on how much of a refund you can get. And I think is about as the first that'll ever go. Yeah, I mean, I, we could get political on this. I'm pretty <laughs> philosophical, um, and um, I think of it as like people don't pay double tax on their rental income. They also don't pay double tax on their interest income from the bank. Yeah. So, I don't know why it would be double taxed for shares, but obviously there should be a limit on anything. Like, you should be taxed. This, this is just exactly. a general rule for anything, right? It's not necessarily a franking credits problem. It's just- And it's it, ju- a, it's a nature of decades problem. too. Because if you look at what happened, like the US, you, you treat better for capital gains in the US. So, yeah. if, you, if you treat capital gains better in, in Australia, well- people will invest less for franking credits. Yeah, um, I think it's just natural behavioral shifts. Yeah. Um, the okay. only challenge I see with this one is yeah. that, uh, so energy, for instance, is has increased in exposure in this because cash flow is improving from whether it's coal or, yeah, I'm not sure if coal's in here or not, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, coal and oil. Yeah. Uh, so, we got like Woodside Energy more. and those types of companies inside the ETF. Exactly. Not no, not saying whether they're it's good or bad, bad or not, yeah. but it's more the fact that it will shift in sectors depending on the performance of those sectors yeah. and whether you want exposure to energy is a separate discussion probably. Yeah. There, so, this is what we call a dividend ETF. Um, that's just a shorthand to say it just targets dividends. There are about 10 of them on the, on the ASX and you can buy them through SelfWealth. This is probably the most diversified of them in terms of the number of stocks that are typically inside the portfolio. And there are some other good ones. Like there are some good ones from VanEck or uh, GlobalX. They all have good versions of them, but this is probably the most diversified. So, and it's the largest. So, it tends to make the most sense that we would cover it here today. But um, I think that's, you you hit the the nail on the head there. A lot of people that we talk to on Self Wealth Live are now realizing and they know that they've got to look through the ETF and say, well, it's all well and good to have a high yield ETF, but what's actually inside it? What if I'm loading up on yeah. one sector, I'm already overweight. In the and I already own portfolio. Woodside or BHP, and yeah. then this thing's huge inside the ETF. Like yeah. I've got double BHP. So yeah. 16% of it's in BHP and Woodside. Well, there you go. And even, so say if, for example, 
you had the the VAS ETF, which we just spoke about, and you have this one right beside it, you're getting more of the same. Double, yeah, yeah. So you need to be sensible about how you're actually, on the other side of the, the ETF, what's actually in the portfolio. And that's the kind of top-down diversification perspective. Yeah. Are you relying, are you, you know, putting too much reliance on resources yeah. or banks for your income sources? You'd always be wary of adding this as a core if you've already got a diverse portfolio of ASX listed stocks. Yeah. You mentioned in the first uh, installment of Passive Income Series here on Self Wealth that um, you mentioned that there's this concept of naive diversification where you could just have like four different banks and Telstra and you're like, you think you're diversified. Yeah. But you can also have the same thing with ETFs. People, I've met people who have a 35 ETFs yeah. and they've got five of the same thing. Like they've got the VAS ETF, they've got the A200 ETF from BetaShares, they've got the STW ETF, they've got the IOZ ETF and you think, they all do exactly the same thing. Yep. Now, there is a tiny little argument to be made that, well, if one of the issuers, like ETF providers, goes bankrupt, at least you've still got the other ones. But that's not yeah. the way it works. <laughs> um, so, you're better off just picking one for simplicity and sticking with it. Definitely. And yeah. you, know, you know what your They're exposure is. They're all good, is. by the way. And you, just, and you don't go crazy with paperwork. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. You've got to do your tax. You know, you've got to file all these things. Let's change it a little bit and let's move away from Vanguard, maybe, um, just for a bit of balance. <laughs> What's something else? Uh, this one, I think I know which one you want, you, want, you want to move to. So you tell me what it is. You tell all of us what sure it is. Which one I want to move to? Oh, okay. How about DJRE? DJRE, yep. yes. Uh, so a more, I mean, I call this the little brother issued by State Street. <laughs> Why do you call it little brother? Well, they're third in line to the assets under management throne. So of all the big, yeah, yeah. So BlackRock's over, over a ten trillion, I think. Vanguard's yeah. like. Eight trillion, something like that. Yeah. State Street's only got four trillion, so they only manage four <laughs> trillion dollars for their investors. Yeah, it's little, 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 little brother. brother. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, State Street. <laughs> so otherwise known as Spider SPDR. Yeah, uh, we can see that. So Spider, just so you know, SPDR. If you see that in your self wealth account, which I've got it on the screen here, um, that's the ETF business within the mothership. So yep. that's that's how you know that those are that's SSTA. the ETF division. Yeah. Yep. Um, so tell us a little bit about this. Uh, again, index fund tracks the so DG DJRE tracks the Dow Jones Real Estate Securities Index. So what we call A REITs, Australian Real Estate Investment Trusts. Mm -hmm. uh, these are G REITs, Global Real Estate Investment Trusts. Yeah, uh, incredibly diversified, and it's kind of it comes back to this this view of having different economic exposures within a portfolio to, to that's that's aiming to build. Passive okay. income. Okay. You don't want to have everything in mining and financial companies in Australia. Having some global property listed on multiple stock exchanges brings real diversification. Yep. Uh, 400 million, I think, under management or so, 0.5% fee. They hold 255 different different stocks yep. uh, listed on multiple markets um, as, as everything. A lot of it's in the US, 70% in the US. Uh, and I think one of the unique things here is it actually yields 4%. Which so, is very yeah. unusual for US. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I was surprised when I looked at it again. Yeah, <laughs> that the yeah the total rental yield is about four percent, which is pretty attractive and pays six monthly. Um, but the uniqueness in this probably comes in some of the top holdings that are within it, okay. which I was going through yesterday. So we wouldn't know any of these names unless you listen to US podcasts or anything. <laughs> yeah. But Prologis, so it's like a massive US logistics property owner. Okay. So, like we think about maybe Cube or something here that owns logistics centers. Yep. Uh, Digital Realty, as the name suggests, owns data centers. So, you're looking at really different huh. parts of the economy. Um, That's quite hard to get exposure to here in Australia other than through something like NextDC, which is the server. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so. highly kind of capital intensive, the, I think they're building as well as, yeah. as, well as managing here. And then- I mean, the well-named Simon, <laughs> if you've heard of Simon <laughs> Property Group. Yeah, it's massive. Which, yeah, more like Australia, like maybe similar to vicinity or yep. not quite, owns malls and outlet malls. And if you've been to America, yep. you know, malls and outlet malls are- Everywhere. Much more popular than they are yeah. here, I think so. And you can just see multiple, That's so that's the top three holdings are from three different sectors. So, it's got industrial, it's got retail, it's got digital, it's got healthcare, mm. really diverse ranges of income. Whereas and a lot of them in Australia are more traditional industrial- Either mixed, either mixed, and they hold a bit of everything, but there's very much a focus on office in Australia, yeah. uh, office and retail, which are probably the two most challenged sectors if you think longer term, um, and and that's because the that part of the economy isn't as advanced in Australia, yeah. where we have a smaller population naturally. 
So just to confirm for people that are um, dialing in now, so this DJRE fund or ETF basically just invests in real estate investment trusts, which then invest in property. Yep. So you've exactly. got- so you're basically, it's just one big basket of global property. Yep. And those property owners benefit from uh, rental income. And capital appreciation. And the increase in the value of those properties that then get absorbed up into the REITs. And then that's passed back through to the ETF to us here in Australia. Yep. Okay. So that's really interesting because that's a totally different thing to what we were just talking about with Aussie shares and then the, the dividend focus. Yep. I mean, there'll be a tiny little bit of overlap in maybe a global ETF, which we'll talk to in a minute. Yeah. But for the most part, that's very unique. Yeah, very much. Yeah. Uh, there's, there are, I think there's the only major one on mm. the ASX. Yeah. I, yeah. There, I mean, there's yeah, there's more Australian ones. But yep. um, h- how do you like? So how do you think about something like this in a diversified portfolio? You know, going back, I'm just going to keep coming back to this because I think it's a really good framework for people to work to. Is the four buckets? Would this go in the growth? Section? I think given the more diverse range of assets, so we'll always try and look to what it actually holds, given yep. the more diverse range of sectors, it's potentially in the growth alternatives. Because it's more like infrastructure and- Yeah, digital infrastructure. Yeah. And, and if it was probably if you thought it was only retail and office, then you're more likely to think it'd be volatile and yep. more like an equity. But the the more diverse range of assets that are underneath, it's tilting towards growth growth alternatives. Yeah, if you pull this up in your self wealth account, you can see that it. Um, I've got it here on the screen in front of me. Uh, you can see that the the share price hasn't really done that much. It's been very stable over time, but obviously you're going to get that yield flowing through over time. And that's a good in a good lesson for anyone investing at the moment too. Like we always yeah. talk about past performance, no, no. Yeah, we have to legally say <laughs> that. of future performance, but everything's negative when you look at it now. Yeah. So we'll meet plenty of ETF providers or fund managers, and I just say I don't want to see your performance. For I know if I'm not invested in it, I know it's going to be bad. Yeah. Where to from here? And you need to. We try and separate what the history has been because you're looking at a very different environment for the next five, ten years. Okay. Staying overseas, if it's okay with you. Of course. Yeah. Um, the. This, I th- actually, I think this might be the second most popular ETF in Australia. I could be mistaken about this. IVV? Yeah, IVV, which is the S&P 500 ETF from iShares. Yep. Um, so, what's this? The middle brother? No, the big, biggest the big, brother. Big, big brother. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, or IHVV, the yeah. hedged version. So, there's well. on the screen in front of me here, you will see IHVV. Uh, uh, you'll see me bring up IHVV, which is the same- thing as IVV, except it neutralizes currency. Yep. Um, so, what it does is it invests in the top 500 US shares. So, you get things like Apple, Microsoft, you get Berkshire Hathaway in there probably. Yep. Um, you'll get a bunch of the names you know, like Nike and- Amazon. Amazon. United, Johnson & Johnson. Yeah. Really diversified. When you think about it from an Australian context, if you look at our stock market, we've got four massive banks plus Macquarie. You've got massive two massive- uh, miners in BHP and Rio, Fortescue, Woodside for Energy. Yeah. And then you can go down a few other. CSL is probably the, the anomaly in the list. But we're very, in Australia, we're very top heavy and we're very sector heavy. Yeah. We've got two like financials and resources. Everyone so, says it's the same case in the US, but then you look at the, the balance of this and it's significantly more diversified. Yeah. Maybe it's overweight tech, but you know, Apple is the largest holding and it's 6%. BHP is the largest, largest holding in the ASX and it's over 10%. Yeah. Uh, and you, even just comparing, wow. love BHP, but Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Berkshire, Alphabet as your top five holdings. So, no offense to Australia, but incredibly high quality companies. Yeah. Like true global leaders in literally everything they do. Yeah. So, it's com- and that's why the there's so important to have some overseas exposure within portfolios and why things like IVV are so valuable that it's making people more comfortable to invest overseas yep. when historically they haven't. Yeah, this is um, this is a really good example of getting overseas exposure really simply via your your self wealth account. You just plug in the ticker symbol, IVV or IHVV if you want to neutralize the currency, and you get exposure to these. And it's so cheap, like the actual fees that are charged by the IVV fund. Point zero four. I think it costs you more to trade it than it does to maybe not on self wealth, but it costs more to trade it than it does to. <laughs> yeah. To own it every year. Yeah. So, that, like, it's a tiny- Beat uh, is free. Yeah. It's, as we were saying, like, imagine if you just combined this with VAS, you'd have a blended- If you just did 50-50, just using quick math off the top of my head here, you'd probably have a fee of your portfolio of like 0.07. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's tiny 
usually brokerage is point one percent. So yeah, yeah. So there you go. So look, if you if you think about the combination, if you're using self wealth, you've got nine dollar fifty brokerage, um, which is why the people invest so much on self wealth because yeah. the fee is flat. So you can have huge amounts of money into these ETFs, and then the fees on the ETFs are tiny. Yeah. So you can have like ultra low cost portfolio. Really transparent, really quickly. Um, I think it gives you. It also gives you the flexibility to take uh, yeah. swings. Yeah, true. Where you want, for lack of a better better term, because that, it's so low cost here. You mean? Yeah. So you're keeping your cost of your portfolio low, but then if if you think there's a great opportunity in Asia, in small caps, well then you can pay someone more, and and naturally they cost more to benefit from that information asymmetry in the active management. Yeah. When you keep the cost of your course so low. Yeah, I like it. Um, and that's that's a that's a wonderful wonderful thing. Um, I don't think we really covered this in the first installment of the passive income series, but roughly, like if you were investing in a diversified portfolio, a balanced portfolio, I should say. Yeah. How much of that would be global shares, roughly? Just Within the growth, so I I said a true balanced portfolio would be 50-50 defensive and growth. Yeah. Within the growth portion, you'd probably have 10% alts, alternatives. Yeah. And the rest, I, I would usually say split evenly between uh, global and, and domestic. So, so then- 20-20. So, so, so just to confirm, you'd have that 40% um, allocation to the growth. Yep. And then of that, it would be 20% in each. Yep. Aussie and then global. And that might change at different times. Like yep. Australia's outperformed significantly and the US is significantly cheaper at the moment. So maybe that's some t- a time that you would have a higher proportion in global. So it also depends on your objectives, yep. how much we're balancing income and growth. Yeah, I like it. I think one of the keys with this one is that, you know, dividends are useless without growth. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is this is the portion of your portfolio where you want to be, you know, the, I think the earnings growth from this is something like 8 9% per annum from the S&P. Yeah. So this is where you're getting that that growth core of your portfolio. And naturally, all the top 10 holdings there are growing companies. Yeah, cool. And by the way, even though we say, or Drew says that 20% is in global shares, it might not all be in this one ETF. Like, you, yeah. you, we're only covering 10 today. There'll be multiple in there. Um, this is just one expression. One of the questions I get a lot is, well, what about VGS? Which is the Vanguard version? Yep, it's more global. Yeah, sure, you could use that too. It tracks the MSCI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is slightly more diversified. Yeah, because you've got like Europe and you've got some emerging markets in there as yep. well. Um, sure, you could use that as well. Um, just be conscious of your overlap and like where the different pieces of your puzzle come together. Um, one thing that we haven't talked about, Drew, which I'm, I'm going to shift to now, uh, is this thing on the ASX known as BH. YB. And I'll bring this up on my screen in front of you so you can see what I'm talking about. BHYB, it's from Beta Shares. It's the Beta Shares Australian Major Bank Hybrids Index ETF. What a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Uh, I think probably, I'm not sure about the in the number of investors invested in hybrids in on, on self wealth. Yeah, um, I, I don't know the exact number reason, either, yeah. but I, I mean, there'll be a few because they're so popular in Australia. Yeah. So hybrids are a form of funding for banks and other corporates. They're they're called a hybrid because they're ha- part like equity and part like debt. Yeah. So on the debt side, they pay a interest payment or a distribution that is cal- recalculated every quarterly, every quarter or every six months, at a set premium over what the prevailing interest rate is. So the bank bill swap rate, most of them would pay something like two percent above that. But that's reset. So if you think about that, if inflation interest rates are going up, your interest payments go up and reverse if they're going down. Yep. On the equity side, they're technically, if you've seen a PDS, about 120 pages long. <laughs> in the very worst case that a bank went bankrupt, which hasn't happened in I think for 40, 50 years. Yep. And they're all essentially government guaranteed by the bank by the by the government now. They could be converted to equity, in which case you could get less money than you invested into them. Uh so let me just unpack this then. So their shares, they're like shares in listed that, on the ASX. In that you can buy them on the ASX, but yep. this fund bundles them up together. This ETF bundles all these hybrids together. Only bank issued hybrids. Only yeah. the, from the banks, not from yep. like Telstra's and Woolworths and all that. And that's an important distinction because the banks are APRA regulated, so they're prud- prudentially regulated, and they always have to have enough capital yeah. to fund their uh, deposits. So that's why they, there's so many of these. Yeah. Um, okay. So you can buy these things on the market, or you can get it bundled up in a fund like this, and you get regular income. Yep. Through 
because you're it's like a preference share in a way isn't it because all preference shares yeah. yeah because and if you if you follow warren buffett and you follow us investing you'll hear someone talk about preference stock and all that sort of stock versus common stock common stock is the thing that you probably have most in your portfolio yeah. it's very common Ordin- in ordinary shares <laughs> yeah ordinary shares um but there's this thing called preference shares which if you think about them here's the way i think about them is if you receive a dividend as a common or common stockholder or an ordinary shareholder you, the preference or the hybrid shareholder has to get their bit first. Yep. And you can't get a dividend if you've got common stock unless they've got theirs first. Yep. So, if, they, if it's ever cut, the preference holder will be paid before the ordinary shareholder. Yep. And that's the key distinction here because what that effectively does is it means that it is a lower risk option than the shares, the normal shares, but they're not risk free. Exactly. This is very important to understand. They can be converted to those shares uh, if things go awry, I Com- guess. Very awry, not yeah. slightly awry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they have to. And, and the, banks, the banks don't want that. So, you, you need the ca- the capital of a bank to fall below, I think it's 8%. Yeah, it's um, a long way. Yeah, and most of them are at capital ratios from memory about 13 to 14% yeah, at the moment. Well over 10%, yeah. Yeah. And so, the idea here, Drew, is you would use this for income and less volatility, like a bit less volatility. Um, we used them quite a lot in the last few years because we didn't hold government bonds. We didn't. We didn't want to hold fixed rate debt. So you had or to look for something else. That that something income. that was floating because yeah. we're worried interest rates would increase. And obviously, bonds fell fifteen percent. Yep. Most of the preference shares just keep paying their inc- actually paid higher income. Yep. And didn't change much in value. Yeah, that's. Yeah, that's what I did too um, yeah. for our members. I, I moved them across into uh, this type of thing as well as cash, which term deposits they weren't great, but they were better than bonds. It is quite a small market though. That's the only challenge with yeah. hybrids because most issues, I think they're in, particularly in the banks, there might be five per bank, six yeah. per bank at any given time. So, that's yeah. you know, 24, 30 and most of them are anywhere from 500 million to a billion. So, it's not a massive market. snapped up market. pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, okay. So, just final question on this BHBY thing. Um, if you were going to put this in a portfolio, would this be in your growth alternatives or your defensive alternatives? More likely defensive. Okay. Not, because not more likely, defensive. Yes. Yeah. Because, <laughs> because it's more bond-like? And there's no- You're not buying it with the expectation of any growth. More uh, than 75% of the returns are coming from income. Yeah. More, more like ninety percent of the returns. Okay. Um, we did manage to buy them cheap during the pandemic, yeah, but that I was about it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that covers off, I guess, a lot of the um, the like the products or the the things that we we've looked at on the ETF side of things, which is a massive component. I know when you build portfolios, like you look at all of these things, and um, you know some of these may be in your clients' portfolios, but now uh, it's still you know so important, um, Drew, that investors focus on individual stocks as well because well we focus on them because we know individual shareholders love them i love individual shares yeah they might not be always in the core of my portfolio but i love individual companies and hearing the story so one of the things that we covered recently which i'm happy we're going to talk about today is um afic australian foundation investment company i'll bring this up on my screen so you can see exactly what i'm talking about inside self well afi is the ticker symbol Australian Foundation Investment Company. We spoke about this in a Self Wealth uh, live episode late in 2022. And we spoke about, um, I think it was Finger Lick and Licks was the title of the video because they're listed investment companies, often called Licks for short. Um, tell us a little bit about this, mate. Uh, Afic or listed investment companies? Oh, yeah. Well, tell us a little- Or should I explain maybe a listed investment company and then you can explain Afic? That'd be perfect. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, a listed investment company is different to an ETF. It is a company structure. So, the the shares or whatever the company owns is owned by the company. Whereas, when you have an ETF, it's a trust. And under the law, what that means is that you are the beneficial owner of all the things that are inside that trust. So, the key difference is this. When uh, capital gains are made or taxes incurred inside an ETF, as well as income, that is automatically passed back to you. Which is why sometimes at the end of the financial year, you might see an ETF's price in your brokerage account just fall randomly. It might fall 5% or 10%. And that's because you're they're sending you back the capital gains and the income. Yep. Now, with a company, the listed investment companies are just like any company like BHP, except their sole purpose is to invest in other companies. And you just see them on the stock exchange. 
Affic is one of the biggest ones, and it's one of the first in Australia. Uh, and it's you can buy shares in this company, and it has tax benefits in that they can smooth the income stream coming back to you. Yeah, that's why they're they're so attractive for a lot of retirees and a lot of income focused investors. Yeah, I mean the perfect example was during the because they declare their own dividends. The perfect example was during the pandemic when the banks cut dividends by fifty percent, even though Affic owns something like where is it. 20% in the banks and 13% in materials, they didn't cut their dividend. Yep. They actually kept it flat. They had a bank of cash and franking credit, so they were able to make that return. The, the income remained consistent despite yep. the dividends falling off from all the companies they owned. So, uh, you can include this in the, the portfolio um, knowing that it's going to be well managed. Exactly. And I mean, it, the, one of the big, the, one of the things they have to do is report pre-tax and post-tax Net yep. tangible asset value, because it's been around for so long, there's a lot of capital gains inherent in these portfolios. That's why they're not perfect for yep. everyone, uh, and they can't actually trade all that much without triggering capital gains. So, meaning that because they've been investing, say, for example, they might have bought BHP 10 years ago or 20 years ago, yep. just like any other company, they have capital gains tax. Yep. So, they're just going to keep holding onto that share rather than sell it and trigger the capital gains and have to pay that. And there won't be a lot of turnover, yep. which is why- and and. One of, that's also one of the reasons that sometimes they trade at premiums and discounts. I think Affic's always at a premium. It's almost usually. always, almost yeah. always not. Yeah. But then ninety percent of all the other listed investment companies trade at a discount. Yeah. Uh, it's more like your average, so it's more it tracks very similar to the to the return of the ASX. Yeah. But the yield is reasonable and consistent. I think it's about three point three. I'm not sure what's on, oh, on Southwell South well, plus yeah. plus franking. I can have a look now inside Southwell. Just go to the overview tab. Sometimes they'll pay three point two percent is what I got. Yeah, plus and then sometimes they'll pay a special dividend. They'll benefit from when we used to have off market buybacks. They'll might be involved in off market buybacks. They'll pay out additional when cash gets too high. Um, but that that ability to smooth payments from a fairly diverse portfolio of investments is super valuable. That's why retirees love them. Yeah. Um, if I was starting from scratch today, I'd probably err towards ETFs yeah. as a first protocol, but I know a lot of your existing like clients that come to you and say, hey, Drew, I'd love to get your financial advice. They would come to you with a these already in their portfolio. Yeah. yeah. So, that's a great one. So, that's AFI listed on the uh, ASX uh, under the ticker symbol AFI. Um, the second company that we want to talk about uh, today is Wes Farmers. We did do one session on this where we talked about five stocks fit for a king um, <laughs> and we talked about wide moat companies and big castles because this is a business that owns Bunnings. Yeah. I'll let you do the rest of the explainer in just a second, but um, very, very popular in the self-wealth community and I'll just bring it up on my screen in front of you so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, Wes Farmers Limited, ASX at WES. Uh, if we go to the stock chart here, we can see it over time. Um, it looks like it's come off a bit recently, but this is a business that has been super impressive for a very long time. Don't be tricked by the scales on the, the graph here. It's one that uh, when we look around the market, we see very few global leaders yep. in Australia. We see West Farmers and their management as being one of the best, you know, would probably stand up to the rest of the world. They're essentially a conglomerate, yep. but a conglomerate. So, conglomerates just own multiple businesses. Yeah, it's the business of businesses. Yeah, exactly. And that's so valuable. When you're talking about income, they don't pay the best, you know, the highest dividends, about 3.7 plus franking. Uh, but they're allocating capital towards growth and to multiple sectors. So, yeah. Bunnings might be the majority. I uh, had the numbers on this. It's something like 65% yeah. of earnings. Yeah, it's better. But they also have operations that they own Kmart, they have. Uh, Chemical and yep. and uh, Industrials. engineering industrial businesses. They own office works. They own Catch Group, so an online growth company. They bought Australian pharmaceuticals that f- yeah. supplies Priceline from yep. memory, and they have their own, they're growing. I think deploying about a billion dollars into lithium uh, yep. mining and production in WA as well. So multiple income sources in multiple parts of the economy. It's like the the you know the perfect company for sustainable and growing income. And they sold coals, obviously, a few years ago too. Yeah. Um, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but uh, quite a few. Uh, I, th- I think the business started over 100 years ago. Um, West, Farm- West Farmers, it's, West. it's often called, <laughs> but it's Wes Farmers. Uh, it is headquartered in WA though. With, a, with an apostrophe or not? I don't think so. No. <laughs> um, so, Wes Farmers um, is a stalwart of in portfolios. It's the type of business, like if there's probably 10 dividend stocks in the ASX, this has got to be in my top 10. Definitely. It's- you don't need to stray, stray much out of the 200 to find quality companies that yeah. pay consistent dividends. And it doesn't need to grow that much if it's paying, you know, 
at the time of recording, 3.7% dividend plus franking credits. It's near 5%. It doesn't need to grow that fast. It doesn't need to shoot the lights out to no. produce an above market return. So that's a really interesting business and it's a brand that no doubt you're familiar with. The next business um, is also a company of companies, but uh, probably even more so, which is quote unquote Australia's uh, Berkshire Hathaway or uh, not quite Australia's Warren Buffett, but Australia's Berkshire Hathaway, which is, and I'll bring it up now in Self World. Another Buffett mention. Another Buffett mention. That's, uh, I feel like I've got to do, uh, have a drink every time I talk about this. But uh, so Washington H. Sol Pattinson and Co. was it basically it traces its roots back to, I think it's Louis Pattinson, uh, and started as a, basically a pharmacy business and has evolved through many, many years. Um, it actually, I think, so this is interesting. They, owned a big stake in Australian Pharmaceuticals, which is a company you just mentioned, if I'm not mistaken, yep. which was then bought by West Farmers. Yes, yeah. I think so. They got so, a lot of stakes, yeah. don't they? So, this is um, one conglomerate selling to another one that's also on the ASX. So, Sol Pats, as it's commonly called, uh, is run now by the Milner family. Uh, tell us a little bit about the business, Drew. Uh, I believe Nenasivo is about $10 billion, uh, and a similar approach to- uh, Similar in terms of seeking sources of diversification, but different in terms of what they're diversifying into. Yeah. Uh, so by far, I think the largest uh, the largest unit is about thirty one percent of the of Seoul is invested into large cap Australian companies. Yeah, right. So CBA, CSL, Macquarie, uh, all all the same old names, probably with some mid cap sleeping through. That's about thirty percent of of what they manage. But they and they also invest across. Emerging and smaller companies, so you're getting yeah. some diversification. They got some private equity, brickworks, uh, yep. private businesses, agricultural assets. So they own a bit of farmland. I believe citrus and poultry. So it's again seems like you're kind of, kind of reiterate, reiterating the same message: investing for passive income. You want that income to be well diversified, even if it's coming not just from ten different companies, but from yeah. companies that have operations in multiple sectors. You mentioned in the first uh, instalment of the passive income series that. One of the things that where people go really wrong is they're too short-term focused. Yep. And I think this is especially pronounced with stocks, yep. is people log into their self-wealth account and they go, well, I'm just going to find the stock that has the biggest yield. I've seen that many times oh, before. It, oh, I think this is like the first journey. It's like a rite of passage for people. And then that company doesn't pay a dividend or cuts its dividend and you think- the Stock price falls 40%. Stock, stock price falls. I'm also not getting the dividend. What is happening? Yeah. So, it is so fundamentally important that you understand- that a business, how it's growing its yield. It's not just what, because the dividend yield, by the way, just in case you don't know, is based on last year's payments. And the current price. And the current share price. But that doesn't mean that the dividend is going to be paid next year. On the screen in front of me here, you can see I'm on the Washington Hate Soul Patents and Co page, or Soul, as, as Drew mentioned. Um, and you can go to this forecast tab here. And if you scroll down, you can see analyst forecast. The one that I'm particularly interested in is the dividends per share. And we can chart this here. And you can see that in 2022, the dividend was 72 cents per share. There'd be franking credits in that as well. But in 2023, it's forecast to be 82. And then the year after that, 84. Now, they might not be specifically correct, but like we're just going for that, as you said in the first installment, generally correct. Yeah. Um, and so, the one of the reasons that this might have happened too, by the way, is the, the merger with Milton. Yeah. Um, so, it's a bigger beast now. So, maybe there are synergies there. But that's how you can look inside your self-wealth account and you can see what exactly uh, is the current consensus amongst analysts. Again, Drew, this is probably in my top 10 individual stocks. I don't know if you have a view on that. but um, I haven't historically followed it as closely. Um, but yeah, the more I look at it, the more interesting it is. I think the Mil Personally, I think the Milner family who run it are the most long-term focused investors I've seen probably in Australia. Yeah. Um, and they can be because they have been doing it for th three or four generations. They've got the patience and yeah, the trust of investors. That's it. So, there are two more companies we want to get to here before we put a put a lid on this episode. Um, this one is probably going to catch people a little bit off guard because they're probably like, oh, I didn't think about this as a true dividend stock, but I know you've been following it for quite a few years, which is Macquarie Group. It's actually the top holding of- Sol. Is it? Yeah. So ah, as in there in so Washington hates Sol patents and direct stock portfolio. Eleven percent is in Macquarie Group. Oh wow, okay. So I'm just bringing up the share price here so people can see it uh, on the screen. 
And I'll just go to the overview and stock details. Oops, wrong tab. There we go. You can see over time, the business has performed exceptionally well. This is since 2013. I'm looking at here, Drew. doesn't include the GFC, which is a bit of a cliff face for it. I think they said they've always had a, they've had a profit every year, including the GFC, though. Yeah, they have. Yeah. yeah. And they, yeah, they've been profitable for over 50 years in a row. So, this is a business that f is not just you know a one-trick pony. It might say bank on it, and you might think about it as an investment bank, but it does so many different things. Now, the way they explain it, I think, is fantastic, which is they have an annuity stream business and a market-facing business. Yep. So, a lot of the coverage is on their market-facing business. If you, like in the last 12 months, you would have heard about Macquarie benefiting from energy prices going crazy or since that part of their business, they help energy companies and other groups to hedge the price risks. A lot of insurers want yep. like Whitehaven Coal to hedge the price of their coal or gold and whatever, whatever it happens to be. So that's very market driven. They also have Macquarie Capital. So they do help with IPOs, help with capital raisings. But the, I mean, the part we love is <clears throat> dividend or <clears throat> income focused investors is their annuity streams. Yep. Macquarie Asset Management, they manage $800 billion in yep. assets. A massive yeah. amount of that is now in green investments, so helping fund the renewable like energy. Solar farms, that sort of stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, they have a banking and financial services business. I think we both bank with yeah. Macquarie now. Um, and then part of their common commodities business they see as annuity streams as well. So annuities just yeah. clip the ticket, keeps growing, and in my view, in the banking part at least, they're delivering a better service than most of the, most of the competitors. Yeah. And the market facing is more volatile. So that annuity stream is where your 3.6% dividend Noting that franking's only 40% yeah. because a lot of their earnings are coming in US and UK and Europe. Yeah, truly diversified bank. It's the, it's the most diversified bank we have here in Australia. Um, and it's got the thing about it, they call it the millionaire factory. It's gobbling up. It gets so much talent in the door and they just solve problems. It's gobbling up a lot of the, the share and retail banking, so mortgages, that type of stuff. Even in across the hallway, they're doing things like- building platforms for financial advisors to use. Yep. Um, and they're just doing it so well. So that's Macquarie Group. Um, as Drew said, doesn't get the full amount of franking credits because it earns a lot of its revenue and does a lot of its business overseas. But another way to get global diversification through a business that doesn't do one thing. And you might notice a similar theme here is that all of these direct stocks we're talking about don't do one thing. Except for the last one. Except for the last thing. Which, <laughs> But even within that, it does mainly four different things, which we'll get to in just a minute. We'll, all will be revealed. Um, and this is what we call, you don't want to own a one-legged stool. Like, just like if you have a, 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 a bar at, in your house or you have like a dinner table, you don't want just 10 seats with like one leg on the seats because they're going to fall over. You know, if one of those things goes wrong, say goodbye to the seat. So Unless we, that's, that seat or that leg is super cheap. Yeah, yeah well then, yeah, maybe you'd... you'd consider investing in it. But for the most part, the reality is that you want businesses that have multiple income sources, just like you would want to have multiple income sources, because then it just lowers your risk. Yep. And the final company is BHP Group. I'll bring that up on my screen right now. BHP, we've talked about on the show many times, is the big Australian, the biggest mining company in Australia. Uh, we can see the market cap, $229 billion at the time of recording, a humongous business. And even though it does mining, to your point, Drew, it does different types of commodities. And it does mining incredibly well. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think they they had delivered record earnings of 40, US $41 billion. I think that's a that's half that's, or full year. That's incredible. Uh, Either way, like $41 billion is incredible. 65% gross margin. Jeez. So, and, and what it tells you is they've got the highest quality, lowest cost assets, and that's what BHP has always been about. And that, while they might be cyclical, that gives the protection for the dividend yeah. that even if prices fall when everyone else can't make money, BH, BHP will still be pumping out cash flow. Yep. So, the, the cost of producing iron ore is 16 bucks, and they sold it on average for 113 yeah. in the last 12 months. Uh, iron ore is 65%, so normally you'd be a little bit wary. Yep. But- they're looking at, the, the, I think management's thinking about this. So, they're looking, the copper is also already a, quite a large part of the business. They're looking mm. at buying or in negotiations for Oz minerals. minerals at the moment. So, more copper yep. and I think some gold. So, diversifying a bit more uh, into, yeah, to try and reduce the reliance on a single uh, sector like Rio Tinto, I think is something like 92% iron ore at the moment. Yep. Well, this is an incredible business. Um, it's, the last 10 years, you could probably say, for BHP have been one of flux. Yeah. 
uh, moving. It used to have that petroleum business, which is separated, or oil and gas, which is sold off to Woodside. Um, and now it's recognizing copper as a major play in its pillars. There was this old thing. You remember um, BHP had the quote unquote progressive yeah, dividend yeah, strategy. Yeah. And then I and all just went to straight down. And then they're like, no more progressive yeah. <laughs> strategy. And it was the most political or like yeah, contentious thing, I should say, yeah. amongst the investment community. As because it was like, yeah. my dividend stock. It's like Telstra. Yeah. Yeah, it's just like, like it was around that time cut, too. Yeah, yeah, they cut her at the same time. And yeah. that, I mean, any time there's a policy like that, you have to be wary. Yeah. We're always going to pay out more as a dividend. Well, why, what management would why? lock themselves into that type of strategy? Yeah, yeah, dividends probably, now are probably better the than outgoing them. management. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a little hand grenade for when yeah, you walk yeah. in. Um, but the reality is it has been, despite that setback in dividends, it has been a tremendous dividend stock over a long period yeah. of time. Yielding 8%. Yeah. So Backward looking. Yeah. Yeah. And that was up 8% on the prior year. And this is what, but we, we should also caution people that when you make super normal profits in mining, there's no guarantee that that continues in the next little while. Exactly. So just be sure when you look at resources companies in particular that you are not overly reliant on that. We talked about if you own BHP and you own the VAS ETF and the VHY ETF, like if those were your three things, you'd have like most of your portfolio probably be BHP. Yeah, you'd have 11%, 10%, and then if you go holding 10 stocks, another 10%. Yeah. And, so, yeah. Yeah, so, a lot of your portfolio would be in this one company. And you probably, you could argue maybe for or against that it's, you know, so good at all of those commodities that maybe it wins all of those. But at the same time, like it's, it's not necessarily something that you want to do as a matter of course. So, just in summary- the, the 10 different positions that we've covered in this session include uh, the VAS ETF, the VHY ETF, we covered the BHYB ETF, which is the bank hybrids, we covered the IVV ETF, which is the S&P 500 one. I'm just doing all these off the top of my head. DJRE, which is the global real estate. I think we got to 10. Yeah, we got to uh, the uh, AFI or AFIC uh, LIC. We went to Wes Farmers. We did uh, Swashin and H. Sol Pattinson, Macquarie Group, and the final one was BHP, if I'm we not mistaken. Yeah, I think that's all of them. <laughs> that's that's a lot. And that that's just a great start. We haven't talked about Def- bonds. So we didn't start with the defensive allocation, which could be bonds. You could use like IAF. VBND. Yeah, VBND for global bonds. BNDS. Yeah, BNDS. For active management. For active uh, bonds. Or you could use uh, the AAA for cash. Or you could just use a term deposit as well in defensive. Um, There are so many different ways that you can get exposure to the defensive side. But we've introduced you to some of the more exciting ideas in in a passive income portfolio. So remember, when you see a financial planner and you get expert advice, the first thing they do is they do a fact find and try and find out what you want and what's your situation. So this is really important. We kind of skip that step um, because that's basically setting out, okay, what are the rules? How much can I put in this bucket, this bucket, this bucket, and this bucket? And you match that against your objectives. So we've skipped that step. So if don't just go out and put all these things in your portfolio and just make it a bit of a mess. Actually sit down and carefully consider uh, well, firstly, do I need financial advice? This is serious enough where I do need financial advice. But secondly, don't just throw them all together. Yeah. Write down an investment plan for yourself. Think about your own risk profile and do all those things. And always, as we say, before you invest in a fund, read the product disclosure statement, the PDS. That's really important. If you haven't already subscribed to Self Wealth Live, we go live every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Uh, and it's heaps of fun. Drew and I will be answering questions coming up this month. And we will be focusing specifically on building portfolios for income. So if you have those burning questions, please write them down because we will be answering them on the 25th. Uh, that's a Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we'll be in here talking to you about how, you know, so answering some of those real basic or more technical questions around building a portfolio. The next uh, session or installment in the Self Wealth Live Passive Income Series will go live next Wednesday night. And in that, I've basically given Drew this example and I've said, okay, you've got a blank canvas, but here's the example. And I want you to build an $80,000 income portfolio from this. They're probably not at that right now, but this fictitious couple that I've given to you, Drew, are probably, they want to get that. They're aspiring for $80,000 a year. That's what they really want. They've got that in their mind and I'm going to get you to build that for us. Uh, in a session. So that'll be coming up next week on Self Wealth Live. If you haven't already, go and get your Self Wealth account activated because 2023, as we talked about in the first installment, 
It's a great year to be starting to set up a portfolio like this. You can get in touch with Drew Meredith here at waddlepartners.com.au slash contact. Um, Drew, I really appreciate you taking the time to go through these 10 ideas with us. So and loved it. it. It's, uh, enjoy sharing knowledge and, and helping to educate. Yeah. No, we really appreciate it. And there's so much that we can take away from just these sessions. So really appreciate it. I'll see you next week. Self Wealth Live, 6 p.m. 